Hello colleagues. Uh, today I will be talking about indoor navigation and positioning technologies overview. Not about Marrow Mind solution, not about our particular implementation of indoor navigation and positioning, but overall overall overview. Why? Uh, because we have been asked many times what's your opinion about BLE, what's your opinion about ultra wide band, what's the difference between you and ultra wide band. So uh, this pretty long presentation is a summary of our views on different technologies. Of course, with the focus on uh, industrial applications, because we are mostly in industrial and surely we are biased. Uh, but for this particular application, it's not so much about Marvel Mind, but uh, Marvel Mind's point of view of other technologies, including Marvel Mind, of course. Uh, what's the problem? The problem is obvious. GPS doesn't work indoor and precision of GPS 5 to 10 meters is not enough for the robot to move from point A to point B and not to kill anyone. There are many other solutions. Ultra wide band, BLE, Wi-Fi, odometers, sliders, many. But all of them have some serious limitations, usually at precision or price or size or power consumption. In one way or another, you do need to know location of your mobile object, robots, drones, people, in order to do something autonomous. Uh, I will be using much of the terminology. You can later refer to this page uh, to see what I meant. Um, I will be talking about many types of indoor positioning methods, but not all of them. So, for example, I just noticed that uh, we even didn't cover the magnetic tapes or wires because they are so uh, used for AGVs, but they are not here because, no, first of all, they are really uh, old-fashioned, even though they are still widely used. And second, uh, it's slightly different, slightly different types of application. But yes, for AGVs, they are widely used and they are robust. Uh, no, simply we are not covering because they are pretty trivial. Now about types of indoor positioning methods. Now, the first one is drill iteration. Um, of course, RSSI-based methods are also drill iteration. But when I mean drill iteration, I mostly use time of flight. So it's kind of equal in, in my terminology. Uh, wh what are those? GPS, obviously drill iteration, ultra wide band, and of course our technology, which is a combination of uh, precise clock synchronization between station and mobile beacons and the modem over radio and precise distance measurement using uh, ultrasonic pulses. So it's time of flight of ultrasonic. In case of ultrawide band, it's time of flight of uh, very short pulses, so it's in time of flight of radio. In terms of GPS, it's also time of flight of radio, but slightly different technologies, or oh, let's say frequencies. RSSI based. Uh, widely uh, available, known, but they are not designed for positioning per se. They're designed for something else. And uh, the fact that you can measure the position, it's kind of additional plus without much investment additional needed. And that's the biggest benefit. All these technologies like Billy, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, they're designed for data transmission, not for positioning. But yes, if you are able to measure RSSI, so radio signal strength indicator or radio signal strength, by measuring that, you can estimate, you know, with not high precision, but nevertheless, you can estimate the distance. So that's the huge assumption of RSSI methods. There are many. Uh, I highlighted some of them. Triangulation. Uh, again, uh, trilateration is uh, calculating the position based on several two three distances and the uh, crossing of those distances so several circles are crossed in one point and you see okay this is my uh, location point triangulation is the same but crossing of lines so angles instead of distances for triliteration triangulation is great uh, sometimes easy to implement but usually is not as precise as triliteration for larger distances because uh, for the angle, usually you don't have a, such a great uh, precision of the angle as the distance. Mixed. 
uh, I'm personally a great uh, uh, fan of uh, all kind of fused methods and mixed like BLE plus angle of arrival is already an attempt to mix uh, two things BLE like RSSI plus the direction it gives you uh, more precision or more let's say capabilities in general but of course for the expense what is the expense mm, again it's more expensive and more complex odometry great thing many gvs many robots are using why not of course it is prone for collection of errors but for the short term and the short distance is one of the greatest uh, and very inexpensive options uh, particularly for sensor fusion based uh, systems inertial very inexpensive uh, IMUs, inertial management units, uh, made it possible, but pure inertial systems, virtually impossible. I'm not touching expensive laser based and all those kind of interferometer based different applications. Uh, no, I'm talking about robotics, uh, drones, uh, forklifts, people, again, industrial applications. We're basic MEMS micromechanical IMUs are used and uh, purely inertial uh, IMU based systems are not possible to make. Optical, many. I'm covering only some of them, but in general there are many. And the greatest benefit of optical is that uh, they are uh, becoming more and more capable with very low investments because the cameras are very cheap. The software in volume is very cheap and uh, you can do great things so optical very promising and there are several flavors of this which will be covered qr codes stargazers so when you really you know the camera watch up and see some peculiarities optical flow when uh, the system is detecting peculiarities but on the bottom usually and motion capture which is mostly used in virtual reality I'm talking about not talking about cinema, but virtual reality, augmented reality type of things. Okay, my favorite and always recommending sensor fusion. Sensor fusion, there are many, many, many options because basically you can fuse anything with anything. And for your particular case, you may achieve the best performance. IMU plus ultrasonic or IMU plus odometer plus uh, indoor GPS by my own mind. Many, many. So it's always depending on your particular case. And there are many other, I call them other types and exotic, they're not necessarily exotic, so don't be kind of offended, uh, but many other. Li-Fi, RFID, magnetic, magnetic tape, wires, many, 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 many other. So they are depending on, uh, on a particular case, use case. So even RFID, which is doesn't, uh, RFID doesn't give you location. But if you go through the gate, and RFID marks that you went through the gate, it is effectively location. Yes, it's very imprecise, but in many cases, this is sufficient for industrial applications. Uh, okay, some you know, high level statement, statements. No methods or RTLS is good for all. Even my own mind is not as perfect, certainly. So it means that there are many requirements and those requirements are usually contradicting. Price, update rate, power consumption, size, you know, line of sight, non line of sight, external interference, noise, many, many. I just list some of them. Update rate, uh, outdoorness, IP67 or explosion protectors, price, power consumption, weight, size, interferences, location or location plus direction. For example, GPS doesn't give you direction. You don't know where you are facing. And for robots or anything autonomous, this is one of the most important elements. Sh where shall I drive? Where shall I fly? You don't know. You need to move, so it's not a trivial thing to, to identify the direction. Notice that magnetometers are not available indoor. If I forgot to mention it's even deeper, we do not recommend to use magnetometers indoor ever. Sooner or later you will face the issues and it will you know collapse all your thing. So use something like Myron Mind implementing as paired beacons. So you have two beacons on some base, 20, 40. 60 centimeters base is already enough for my own mind to have very precise a few degrees uh, direction. Use it. Don't use a magnetometer and unless you're really, really, really forced to, unless you will have calibrations, unless you are mostly outdoor but not indoor. As soon as you move indoor, 
a bit uh, ferromagnetic or electrical current or something, that's it. You don't have direction. Uh, and then sometimes you need not only positioning for your indoor positioning system, but also data flowing flying in and, and out from the system. So this is critical because if you don't have it in your system, then you may have to deploy another communication system. Very many people asking, uh, can I combine uh, LoRa with you? Yeah, but why would you? Because we do have our own wireless, so we can use it for uh, slow speed data moving in and out Marwine beacons. You don't need LoRa. You don't need to invest in LoRa or ZigBee or anything like that on top of Marwine. Some uh, systems uh, uh, supported by default, like ultra-wideband, for example. There is also data, even high-speed data. Uh, but some sy systems, they don't have it. Now, let's start with RSSI-based systems. They are very uh, popular. There are many, uh, but all of them have more or less the same limitation. And limitation uh, stems from the fact that uh, RSSI-based systems are not designed for positioning. They are data transmission systems. And they uh, uh, make a huge assumption that if signal of the radio strength is, for example, minus 70 dBm, then my distance would be, and you can see, ideally, it would be around 18 meters in this particular case. Oh, sorry, 18, 11 meters in this particular case. But those dots, are examples of real measurements. So with 70, minus 70 dBm, you measure strength of the radio signal, and then you are guessing the distance. It could be, in some measurement, 2 meters, in some other measurements, 5 meters, in some other measurements, 8 meters. OK, if I measure minus 70, where am I? 2 meters, 5 meters, or 8 meters, you see? The range is from 2 meters to 8 meters. It's very, very, very difficult to be Lee-based systems or LoRa-based systems to actually calculate. Of course, they do, but they do mostly because of multiple beacons and very, very complex algorithms that are somehow out of this complete mess of data from a single beacon estimate where could it be. And still, of course, the precision that you are getting from uh, our, our side-based system is uh, not high. No, to say at least. It's for Wi-Fi, 2 to uh, 5 meters. Uh, so sorry, for BLE, it's 2 to 5 meters. For Wi-Fi, uh, 5 to 10, uh, depending on whom you listen to. Uh, but, of course, the greatest advantage of our side-based system, if you have uh, BLE on your person, like your phone, you don't need to give the person anything. It's kind of free cheese. You don't need to install anything on the person. You can track something that the person already have, the phone, which is great for tracking people in the airport, in uh, uh, shopping malls, somewhere, basically people with the phone. If we're talking about industrial applications, uh, the benefits are slightly degrading because you need to install something on their forklift or something on the robot in order to track it. Not high expense, but still, it's not free cheese anymore. You need to install something. And of course, the, uh, the, the greatest, greatest disadvantage is then it's, it's essentially uh, the essence of the system, so RSSI-based. It means that inside the building, you have uh, uh, a field, electromagnetic field. And this electromagnetic field strongly depends on the environment, metal, uh, anything that affects uh, the electromagnetic field. And let's imagine you are inside the warehouse. You don't change, and even uh, nothing is changing between you and the beacons that are uh, used currently by your system, by your mobile beacon or by your phone in order to uh, localize. Nothing in between is changing. But uh, a forklift, a huge piece of metal is moving somewhere uh, aside, you know, on the right, five meters from you. RSSI in your point 
will be changing because RSSI, in your point, is uh, interference uh, between, no, not interference, but it's a combination, let's say, of all fields from all the beacons, direct light, uh, reflected light, uh, all, all this. And it means that your location will be distorted by something which is not even in between you and the beacons which are handling you. And if there are something which is in between, of course, the strength of the signal may change drastically. And of course, uh, it requires a lot of additional software. It, lo it requires a lot of additional capabilities like uh, automatic calibration and automatic, uh, let's say, population of data from each of the beacon, mobile beacon, in order to share the data with other mobile beacons when the strength of the signal in particular point uh, is changing. So a lot of a lot of a lot of complex algorithms just to make the system works. It works, and uh, there are many 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 people who are selling BLE. Absolutely great, wonderful for some applications, particularly not industrial applications where there not too much metal. Again, airports, uh, shopping malls, museums, perfect. I would say nearly perfect because you don't need high precision. Two, three, five meters, what is achievable? Okay, good enough, but not for industrial. And of course, RSSI based systems like uh, BLE, they have several flavors. Tobacco, um, imprecision. And one of these is angle of arrival. Basically, instead of one antenna, you have multiple antennas. So you multi uh, use for estimation not only their estimate of the distance, which is very, very, very imprecise, but also the angle. And it improves significantly, up to three times, according to those guys. Up to three times you can improve the precision. Mm, which is great, again, which is great, but for the expense of complexity and for, you know, having those beacons more expensive. Uh, IMU. IMU is obviously a uh, holy grail and uh, you, you, you want it to have purely based on IMU. That would be great if not drift. Unfortunately, there's always drift and by definition there is drift. And the drift is such a high that you, uh, you may not have without additional things like sensor fusion things to have purely IMU based system for industrial applications anyhow uh, you know, plausible or anyhow working in, in real life. So I'm bringing some examples of uh, fusion that makes IMU based RTLS uh, somehow usable. You can go to YouTube and see these wonderful things. Perfect. I love them. They are really, really, really impressive. But don't be uh, fooled. These things works only when you put this on foot. If you put these small things on your uh, shoulder pocket or chest pocket or somewhere, it will not work because it will not be able to detect the point when there's no movement. Because you must uh, cancel the drift of the IMU at some point of time. And this system is detecting this drift uh, by detecting the time when the foot is uh, steady on the surface. At this moment, the system knows that the speed of the foot cannot be uh, not equal to zero. And it basically cancels the drift every time when you step. But if you stay at one point, then the system will not be able to work and the system will start drifting. If you are not walking, but let's say using uh, this mobile beacon or whatever, this device tag not on your foot, then the system will not work. So this is lovely, great for video, but not really great for real industrial applications or any kind of applications which are not exactly like this. Drifting, 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 drifting. Marvel Mind is using IMU Fusion for non-inverse architecture currently. We don't yet support in inverse architecture, sooner or later we will, but in non-inverse architecture we do have it. So this is real video showing, uh, let's say, uh, screen capture of the real video showing 
the performance, how it works. The red dots are dots of ultrasonic. Ultrasonic is great because it gives you absolute position. But ultrasonic may have jumps, obviously. Interference, you know, no line of sight situation, something like this. Uh, IMU, on the other hand, is also great for very short periods. I would estimate is actually a fraction of second, one second, two seconds at most. We recommend not more than quarter of the second without calibration. With great calibration, etc., you can increase it kind of significantly increase, but still it's uh, minus seconds. You cannot have IMU-based system for minutes without canceling the drift because it will drift away far, far, far. Uh, so in our case, ultrasonic is uh, getting or giving to the system absolute location every uh, quarter of the second, so four times a second. And IMU uh, we are using double integration of the, the accelerometer data. Okay, accelerometer plus gyroscope plus everything. So it's pretty, pretty complex. I would say it's very complex. Uh, but nevertheless, for a quarter of the second or half of the second, IMU is good enough in order to stay within two centimeters. And after that, ultrasonic is coming and correcting the, the, that drift. And by combining all this data, you can get the, the best from both. You can get a very, very high update rate from IMU, 100 gigahertz in our case, but it could be 200 gigahertz with, let's say, more capable processors. Uh, so 100 hertz update rate, latency of around 12, 15 milliseconds, and at the same time, cancellation of the drift using ultrasonic every uh, quarter of a second. So four times, eight times a second. So IMU-based RTLS with uh, another system as part of uh, Fusion is great. IMU-based RTLS without any external system, like this foot type, or like in case of Marvel Mind, IMU plus ultrasonic. No, pure IMU or real industrial application will not work. Trill iteration. Oh, obviously, since my mind uh, indoor GPS is based on this, this is the most favorite and the most basic, and I would say the most robust, etc., uh, etc., et et simply because the system is designed uh, for uh, positioning. Oh, already mentioned, trill iteration is not equal to triangulation. Uh, it's not a big deal, but nevertheless, trill iteration is a cross section of circles from known points, in this case light or LEDs, uh, but it could be uh, ultra wide band, it could be barrel mind beacon, or it could be GPS, the same story. You know the distance based on time of flight of something, either radio wave or light or ultrasound. Cross section would be your point, but it never crosses at one point, so you always have some spot instead of point. Um, Again, why trill iteration? Could be bilateration, trill iteration, or whatever, quadra, whatever thing. But trill iteration is the most known term, but uh, all thing is, is cross section. Is a crossing point between three or, or two or more uh, circles. Um, in case of GPS, radio waves in this band. In case of ultrawide band, there are different flavors. So some guys are using uh, all bands, some guys are using, uh, you know, shorter half, or part of this band. The wider the band you use, the higher precision you may get. In case of Marrow Mind, uh, we developed our own system. And the system consists of ultrasound and radio. So Marrow Mind is not ultrasound. Navigation system is not radio-based system, it's ultrasound plus radio. So we have a very precise clock synchronization between all the beacons using radio and very, very precise distance measurement between the mobile beacons and stationary beacons. So we do uh, belong to trilateration type of systems. Uh, critical timing and synchronization. As mentioned in the case of Marrow Mind, it's solved by continuous um, 
synchronization between all the elements and the control of the modem. In case of GPS, the same is done using atomic clocks. No? Okay. Our beacons are significantly less expensive than, than GPS satellites, but we could theoretically install instead of, uh, or use the system instead of continuous synchronization, we could install like rubidium uh, clocks there, whatever atomic clocks. Uh, why it's not dot? No, because you always measure with some, uh, with some precision. You never measure exactly, exactly to the last digit. So noise, interference, abstractions. In order to solve it, redundancy is the best option. Like in our case, three station beacons is enough to calculate the position in 3D. We recommend three plus one. So if one of their beacons is blocked, the remaining three will still serve. You can use three plus one or n plus one redundancy or you can use 2N redundancy. Effectively, you have two fully overlapping submaps, the same area, and the system then will choose between their data from one uh, submap or another submap. Uh, it's pretty complex logic, but in majority of cases, it is able to recover the data and give you the best information, uh, especially in uh, mobile mode. When the mode is stationary, it's a bit more complex because sometimes it's nearly impossible, even in terms of physics, to to recover if you hide uh, somewhere behind the uh, walls or behind somewhere. It's, it's really impossible, even in physics, uh, to find out where you are. Uh, and this is another my favorite topic because, of course, we are all the time compared to ultra-wide band. And uh, ultra-wide band is absolutely great technology. Even though we are compared and uh, we consider ultra-wide band as competition, uh, but nevertheless, we totally respect ultra-wide band. And uh, frankly speaking, if ultra-wide band were available some years ago when we were developing our own system, we wouldn't do that because we needed it for robotics. It was not available, so we had to develop our own system, which eventually became uh, more precise than ultra-wide band. But of course, each system has a limitation. And one of the strongest limitations of our system is requirement for line of sight or line of hearing. But let's go a bit deeper into this. And my point is that all precise, key point precise, real-time location system, RTLS, must have line of sight. Now let's check. If you're inside a wooden house radio wave from gps satellites may go through wood is it line of sight no okay it's not line of sight for you but it is line of sight for radio wave because it can go through not too thick uh wood the same story when uh, people are asking about ultra wide band is it not line of sight system or line of sight system no ultra wide band is also when it's precise. It's also a line of sight system. Simply, their obstacle in front of ultra-wide band wave is radio transparent for those waves. But if you go to the real industrial applications, not the office where I'm sitting right now with radio transparent walls, but the real industrial applications, thick concrete walls, thick uh, brick walls, metal all around, obviously, radio wave cannot go through those uh, obstacles either without uh, complete blocking or without huge distortion. So complete blocking is obviously. If the signal cannot go through, then it cannot go through. There is nothing to discuss. But let's discuss a bit the intermediate case. When the radio wave is going through, first, but second, uh, you need to have a, a high precision, like our case, centimeter level precision. Imagine that your uh, wall is 40 centimeters thick, which is very easily to be. It could be even uh, thicker, but let's imagine 40 centimeters thick. Uh, the assumption for any um, time of flight based systems, 
like ultra wide band or GPS or uh, Marl Mind indoor GPS is that you do no uh, speed of light in case of uh, GPS and ultra wide band is speed of light of radio wave in case of Marl Mind is speed of light of sound uh, yes we know speed of light and uh, Einstein showed that this is this is well-known figure but where it is a well-known figure in vacuum it is a well-known figure in uh, in air which is very very close to vacuum so don't don't pay attention to the difference but if you go to uh, material which is significantly different from air or vacuum then you have uh, electrical okay term Mativity, whatever. No, you have these two parameters: magnetic and electrical properties of your wall. Let's put in this well. I, I will not go to deep to terminology, and those are significantly different from air. Significantly, which means that speed of light inside your wall is not any more three point, uh, or whatever two point nine na 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 uh, meters per second. No. It's completely different and usually uh, much uh, smaller. So it means that inside your 40 centimeters wall, your effective length would be not 40, but unknown to you. Unknown to you from multiple point of view. Now, first of all, you don't know the properties. Second, you usually don't even know the thickness. Because, again, your system doesn't have this data. If it has, you can try to combine it. But it will hugely uh, complicate the system. It's virtually impossible. And I don't know anyone using this in practice. Second, when it goes, as you see, it, it will always be uh, refracted. So the, the direction uh, of the wave will change. Third, the wave will be um, let's say broken so you have one nice falling wave as a result you will have one wave coming through another wave reflecting and also coming through but with some delay so instead of nice pulse you will have a chain of pulses with different amplitudes with different delay unknown to you what is it leading to it is leading that you cannot actually take into account all this data and to make precise. For example, you somehow magically made uh, a radio system capable of uh, one centimeter level precision. But when it goes through the wall, you have 40 centimeters of physical uncertainty, which you cannot guess. It could be in terms of uh, radio wave propagation, 40 centimeters, 50, 60 centimeters, it could be anything. And this 40 centimeters of radio wave inside this is not 40 centimeters uh, in the air or in vacuum. It's uh, longer. So it means that you have some tens of centimeters of uncertainty. Even if the signal coming outside, you, you are able to detect. In many cases, you are not. Because ultrawide band or GPS usually... Uh, have a very very big signal in order not to distort or disturb other systems not to interfere with other systems so usually you don't have their generosity and the strength of their uh, signal in order to be able to detect after it is attenuated summing up line of sight is a must for precise industrial uh, real-time location systems and we always recommend not to try to build non-line of sight unless you absolutely know that it will be radio transparent and unless you absolutely know it will be a uh, simple uh, thing radio transparent walls like in many offices but you go to industrial warehouse pallets metal shelves metal objects large objects they create shadows or completely non-transparent objects uh, for the signal and that's it it's done so this is why in our case 
even the basic wood or glass would be non-transparent. But we are not even trying to make non-line of sight of system and not recommend even radio-based systems uh, to be non-line of sight. Our recommendation, if you want robust industrial application, always use line of sight uh, topology. Uh, okay, but what to do in real life environment? Because no line of sights are everywhere. Shelves, objects, people, doors, glasses, many. Okay, there is no uh, simple solution. And the solution is basically a combination of different solutions. Now, first of all, proper network planning and beacons placement. This is why we usually recommend to place beacons high on the wall or high on the ceiling. And the mobile beacon must always to be placed high on your forklift, high on the person, high on the drone. Why? No, it's very basic. Because the chances that there will be obstruction between the station and beacon and the mobile will be their smallest. It will be the least. Second, uh, redundancy. Use submaps, use more station beacons. So don't make the system non-redundant. If one beacon in 3D out of 3 is blocked, that's it. You will not have 2D. You will have broken 3D. And our recommendation is, of course, use 3 plus 1 or N plus 1 or N plus M or 2N. Or no, 2N at DMA is more or less the same. So basically use redundancy, use overlapping, use proper network planning use proper placement of the beacons. That's the, the strongest, uh, the least expensive option. And it's always depending on your requirement. If you have large open area, like basketball players, that's, that's it. I mean, it's easy to do. You install beacons on the top, you give each player mini RX in our case, put uh, beacons on their uh, shoulder, that's it. It works. But if you go to the warehouse, there are many shelves. Don't try to go the signal through the shelves. You need to cover each ale separately. Submaps on each ale. This is why uh, when we are getting the RFIs and we are asked, okay, how much uh, would it be? Or how many beacons do I need to install for this? We always ask for their floor plan and a few photos just to understand. Because the warehouses are different. Some warehouses don't have shelves then you need significantly fewer beacons to cover. But majority, they do have shelves. Okay, that, but then what are we tracking? 2D, 3D, drones, people. So we need all this information. And I would say any system would need uh, information before even budgetary calculation is, is, uh, is given. Uh, another option, if you are not able to make line of sight or line of hearing, like in our case, uh, use sensor fusion, which is perfect uh, until you recover. Because, for example, you have a shadow from something. But this shadow is small, a column or some minor object. So it creates a shadow of, of uh, whatever, one meter. Okay, fine. Use odometer. For one meter, odometer is perfect. It doesn't yet accumulate error too much. So odometer is driving you. And then when uh, your forklift or the robot uh, is out of the shadow, you use sensor fusion, odometer plus indoor GPS, you recover and cancel the error that odometer accumulated and you are fine to go. Once again, sensor fusion are always the best options. It could be many. It always depends on your particular application. You can use odometer for robots, but you cannot use odometer for drones. But you can use some optical for drones, uh, sometimes optical malfunction, okay, use indoor GPS. So combination sensor fusion is the best, the best option. Odometer plus indoor GPS, IMU plus indoor GPS. What? Sometimes you can tolerate reduction. It must be additional feature. We provide the raw data to you, not only location, but raw data. And you can get our location data, quality signal that you are getting from our data, and raw distances. And you can detect that, okay, it was uh, continuous, continuous, continuous reduction of some distance, then continuous increase of another distance, and then some sudden jump on the third beacon. Okay, you detect this, and in your external algorithm, 
you say okay I, I will be using x and y i'll be not using z for the moment because i cannot trust z anymore it jumps my model doesn't assume that my 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 whatever forklift jumps up it's it's physically impossible i will fix uh and freeze the, the z for the moment it i know that it will give me some error in z and which could be translated in error in, in x y um but if you do it smartly the er error is usually not uh, not so great so for temporary reduction from 3d to 2d you can tolerate uh, abstraction of one of the beacons so it's one of the options in some cases you say okay i will tolerate a lack of tracking now nah, whatever toilet you don't want to track anyone in the toilet fine there's no one else or there's no another way so you track in your corridor then the person disappears okay for one minute then the person is back you're fine so once again it's always about your particular application line of sight is a must so the best option is making line of sight if not possible then you can increase slightly the complexity and recover uh, but in some cases you say okay for me it's not economically vi viable to fill in and to cover and i'm okay to have some black spots well okay it's economical, not not only technical decision, but economical plus technical. Ultra wide band. Now again, we are not in the position to comment much on ultra wide band. No, first of all, we are not as familiar with ultra wide band as with our lovely indoor GPS. Second, of course, ultra wide band is one of the nearest competitors. So uh, again, for me, it would be not in the right position. But point is that there are many flavors of ultra wide band, and uh, let me once again stress, ultra wide band is a great technology great technology what you need uh, to remember is ultra wide band about ultra wide band is the following first of all we certainly do not recommend non line of sight for industrial application because sooner or later you will hit the problem second uh, ultra wide band tags are usually very power efficient and uh, we are reading like whatever half a year one month uh, three years on the one battery that's perfect but at the same time, uh, the stationary beacons or base stations, whatever, depending on uh, on the manufacturer, usually is very time consuming. Oh, sorry, very power consuming. So they do not run on the batteries. And based on our experience, there are many customers particularly interested in battery power supply for the stationary beacons. So sometimes to provide electricity to the beacon is more costly then uh the beacon itself so this is why ble is great in that it's also battery powered on the station and beacons marvel mind is kind of in the middle we usually recommend to run their uh, fixed power supply for everything because it gives you peace of mind but yes you can quite easily get weeks for embedded battery and for the external battery, one year, two year there, okay, fine. For industrial application, simply you'll have large battery next to you. It works with us, it works with BLE, it certainly does work with ultra wide band because usually the base station for ultra wide band require external power supply, pretty high power consumption. So just notice. Don't be fooled with uh, with everything, go go deeper to the details. Lighters. Lighters are perfect, lighters are great but lighters are designed for obstacle avoidance and detection lighters are not designed for positioning yes i'm aware light lighters have been used for agvs for a long time and they're used for cars today etc but lighters are very very complex lighters are very very costly and if you sacrifice in complexity and expense then you have lighters with even less performance. So it means that your chances to be lost in terms of positioning are even higher. Uh, on the right, uh, there are some pictures we, we obviously have got from the internet. Sorry for not giving a link. Uh, yeah, uh, but this is what LIDARS sees in the messy environment of the real warehouse or the real, real environment. It's pretty, pretty messy. So our short recommendation is 
unless you are really not um, limited of mo on money, unless you are not limited on size, because lighters are usually uh, larger and more power consum consuming than other types of beacons. Uh, do not use lighters for positioning, because sooner or later you will struggle. You will have the situation when lighters are prone to, let's say, misposition yourself. Lighters, as an element of a sensor fusion system, with odometer, with indoor GPS, with something else, with external, let's say, visual or with optical, they're great, they're good. But again, then matter of complexity and uh, price and all those kind of things. Lighters are great for obstacle avoidance and detection. Not so great for positioning. My favorite, one of my favorites, uh, robust and simple, like as simple as possible and as robust as possible. QR codes plus IMU plus odometer. That's a fusion. Great. How the system works? You have QR codes or any other types of visual things which are installed either on your floor usually or sometimes on the ceiling or things around. And you have cameras, inexpensive, and they are watching either one QR code in case of, uh, let's say, former Kiva or many, many, many other copycats available in the market on the floor. And between those QR codes, which are inside the warehouse every one meter or every two meters or something, the robot is moving based on odometer. Odometer is perfect. It accumulates error, but usually not sufficient in order to be lost over the one or two distance or the one or two meters distance between the QR codes. And when it comes to the QR code, it corrects the position such a way uh, that uh, error of odometer is not accumulated. Robust, perfect sensor fusion system, very reliable, very great, recommended, obviously recommended. No, there are obviously some other uh, issues with it, like QR codes can be broken, uh, worn out, lost, uh, partially covered, but in general approach is great, robust, very inexpensive and recommended, and this is why many people are using it. Good. Visual. Visual is also great and coming, uh, not without issues, like any other system, but in many, many applications, it's a very good solution. Uh, there are several flavors of visual, stargazing and la landmark navigation. Basically, the camera uh, is detecting something which is peculiar around, like light, like dots, like star. And uh, it's positioning itself against it. Since this is angular type position, so it means that if your star is far, or if your object is far, and when you move by whatever half a meter, your angle changes just a little, then you cannot have uh, you cannot have high precision. That's the biggest disadvantage of any uh, triangulation or uh, angle-based system. And visual position belongs to that because it doesn't usually have time of flight capabilities. The newest cameras with external light, they have it, so it may coming. But here I'm talking about pure, regular, inexpensive cameras that are able to calculate the angle to the object. And by having uh, either multiple objects with different positions, so you calculate the angle and then you calculate the cross section, so this is your position, or you have multiple cameras on you and they calculate the angle to the one known uh, dot and by knowing the distance, you can calculate the relative position. In one way or another, it depends on the other objects. It depends on the distances to other objects. Of course, it's prone to lighting, to uh, fogging, to dirty cameras, many, many, many. But still, great uh, solution because inexpensive and it's progressing very fast because uh, chips, ICs on the drones, on the robots, they're capable to crunch a uh, huge amount of data. And what is, uh, you know, 10 years ago was a very, very difficult task. Today is done by very inexpensive drones. QR codes, very robust. So it's basically helping the system uh, not to guess, but to detect 
QR codes. It's your uh, known dots, which is telling you not only uh, that this is a dot, but what kind of dot. Okay, this is dot in this direction, and you can hide much of information, let's say embed my much information inside the QR code. So by combination QR code and visual position, you can you know do many, many nice things. Inside out and outside in. Now, as you see, uh, this is the difference. You may have a camera or several cameras on your object, like robot, or like your VR camera, and nothing outside. So the camera itself is the peculiarities of the external world and calculates the position against that external world, particularly if the camera knows the map in advance. It, it needs to know. Outside in, um, it's different. So you don't have anything on your person or on your robot. It's very similar to uh, motion capture. So motion capture system, you don't have any cameras on your person. You simply have uh, very reflective uh, dots on your person. And you have many, many, many cameras around. Usually those cameras are expensive, if you talk about motion capture, because the requirements are so. Very low latency. Regular camera gives you 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second. Motion capture gives you 200, 400 frames per second. So obviously they're not a standard cameras. Second, uh, you need to install those cameras pretty densely. Like every two meters, every three meters, if you want uh, centimeter or even sometimes millimeter level precision. Because if you have cameras 20 meters aside, they will not be able to detect your angle, or let's say angle to you with sufficient precision. This is why we'll, uh, in case of um, RTLS, or let's say time-based, uh, you can have very precise tracking even on high distances, but in case of angle-based or triangulation, you really need to place those cameras very closely and densely. And if they are cheap, that's great. If they're very expensive, no, sorry to say, optical flow, uh, sorry, uh, motion capture uh, systems are usually very, very expensive, uh, and running sometimes to tens of thousands for one room, tens of thousands of dollars per room. Um, now I already mentioned cinemas and VR are using motion capture because it's proven technology, high precision technology, but costly. Quality depends on the lighting, depends on the distance, fog, dirtiness, and many, many other things. But some visual systems are great for indoor applications and indoor industrial applications and can be recommended. Um, location update rate. Location update rate is one of the elements uh, of the system. Precision, price, size, yes, but location update. If you have one drone flying for inspection, it's one story. But if you have uh, hundreds of workers inside your warehouse or assembly plant, it's a completely different story. You may want to track all of them at the same time with high update rate. It can be very, very, very challenging task for some types of the indoor positioning system and uh, could be done as easily for 100 people or for one person for another system. So it really depends on the architecture, it really depends on your task. In case of Marvel Mind, we know about this, so this is why we have two architectures. Non-inverse architecture and inverse architecture. Non-inverse architecture, the mobile beacon on your forklift or on your drone is emitting ultrasound, and this is why the system is very robust and can be used with drones, which are noisy. But at the same time, only one mobile beacon can emit at the same time. So it means that if you have one drone, that's okay. If you have two drones, then update rate per drone would be update rate per system divided by two, by the number of drones. If you have one, two, five, it's still okay because you will have still 16, eight, four, or whatever uh, number of hertz, which is okay. But if you have hundreds, or let's say 100 of drones flying, then non-universe architecture will not help you because update rate per drone will be just too slow. Uh, we have inverse architecture, which is great because in case of inverse architecture, it works like GPS. 
station beacons are emitting ultrasound and mobile beacons are receiving ultrasound. This is why since all of them are receiving at the same time from the same station beacons, they can receive 200 mobile beacons easily without update rate reduction. But since uh, those beacons are receiving ultrasound, you cannot place them on noisy objects in case of my own mind. I'm talking about other systems now. So in case of my own mind, because mobile beacon will be receiving ultrasound, which is great for forklift, very, very great for uh, people, perfect for robots, but not so perfect for drones. Because drones are noisy, not only in audible noise, but in ultrasound noise. So it means that the noise from their propellers of the uh, uh, drone will be blocking the signal and the range will be greatly reduced. Not 30 meters like we usually say, not even 20, 10. Maybe it's, it can be as low as 5 meters or even less. So it very much depends on the drone. It very much depends on the relative position, many, many things. To make it short, currently we do not recommend inverse architecture for drones. We recommend it for people, mostly, for robots, for uh, forklifts. Power supply. Power supply is important. Sometimes it's uh, as important as uh, other parameters like price, because uh, battery, battery, battery lifetime, how long? Uh, let's go a bit deeper. How long what? Station beacon, mobile beacon, is it replaceable, not replaceable, chargeable, is it normal conditions, is it uh, external temperature range, many, many other parameters required. So uh, our recommendation is ask questions, ask questions, ask, ask questions, other guys, uh, because it totally, once again, depends on your requirement. If you are capable to provide power supply for station beacons, that's perfect, peace of mind. You don't need to worry about that. Then you need to worry only about your mobile beacons. Then what is your mobile beacon? If you have a forklift, okay, no problem again. You basically supply your mobile beacon from the electrical uh, circuitry of your forklift. That's it, you're done. No issues with the battery at all. But sometimes you cannot have their uh, station beacons on external electricity. No, for example, you deployed uh their navigation system or positioning system for your mobile team uh fixing something under the bridge uh, there is no electricity you need battery and then it's important then you need to ask questions like what's the update rate how many mobile objects what are the temperatures what's the battery lifetime and battery lifetime with the update rate it's always coming because uh, for example, when you see five uh, year battery lifetime, uh, what are the conditions? What is the update rate? What's the range? What are the temperatures around? And also, is it replaceable battery or not replaceable? Sometimes, you know, uh, beacons or tags, they don't even have uh, option to replace the battery. In our case, it's charging. But sometimes you cannot even replace the battery. You need to throw away the complete uh, tag. Uh, also, station versus mobile. So it also depends on the application. Sometimes it's very easy to charge the mobile beacon because, for example, you have a shift and you want to charge uh, every shift. And there's no problem. So because there is a charging for your light or charging for vehicles. Uh, but sometimes it's an issue. And the same with uh, station beacons. Sometimes, okay, there in the wall, there is electricity, no problem to, to cover. But if you go outside, it may be an issue. Or you don't have the permit, or permits are expensive, or something is more expensive than the battery. Then the battery is the option. We do provide all the options. Embedded battery, rechargeable, it's always rechargeable in case of my own mind, external power bank, external battery, or external physical converter. All the options are available, so just choose and ask. Uh, also, technologies are not equal in this regard. So BLE is great in terms of stationary. As mobile, it's more power consuming, but also great. So it provides very, very long time battery. Ultrawide band is uh, perfect for uh, uh, mobile beacons, but terrible for stationary. You do need for ultrawide band power supply for stationary beacons, at least as far as, as we know. 
based on the information available in the internet, so search. Uh, Mind Mind and Dorjip is some kind of in the middle between BLE and ultra -right band in this regard. So yes, you may have one year or two years battery lifetime for both mobile and station beacons, depending on the battery. Large battery, why not? Industrial applications, usually you are not very limited uh, with their size of station beacons. You install there, it sits there, you know, once a year you come, charge it for one year, uh, so sorry, for one day, and then another year is there. That's it. And between this, you use the embedded battery, which is inside. It can last for days or weeks, depending on the, on the update rate. In one day, you return back, you put back the, uh, the battery, and uh, it works there for another year. And then, of course, you need to calculate what is less expensive for you. Have external battery and maintenance once a year. Have external battery and maintenance every two years. Or have external uh, power supply and no batteries at all. So it's all about money and your particular case. Location and direction. Now, as mentioned in the beginning, uh, we do not recommend to use magnetometer or compass inside. Sooner or later, you will have a huge issue with this, uh, simply because there are a lot of ferromagnetic and magnetic uh, materials in door, and it will always distort again sooner or later distort your magnetic compass and magnetic readings and you will not be able to know the direction. The recommended solution is you have two mobile beacons on your object, virtual reality, robot, drone, it doesn't matter, with the sufficient base and then you know their facing, the, the angle. What is the sufficient base? Uh, it depends on the technology. If you have a really precise and navigation system like Marl Mind, then you have centimeters precision then what is two centimeter precision it means that this dot is not a dot it's a spot with two centimeters radius and this is a spot with two centimeter radius if you have uh, whatever 20 centimeters base then your worst case scenario is that your spot is here and another is here so this is your angle and another worst case is here and here this is the, your angle and this is the difference between these two lines would be your uh, error okay in case of ultra wide band that wouldn't be possible with this uh, base no simply because ultra wide band is not as precise and you have not two centimeters but uh, 10 to 30 centimeters but it, you can use it with ultra wide band as well simply you would need to have larger base like one meter base for example uh rtk gps is is uh, perfect for that you have also centimeter level precision, but uh, unfortunately, RTK doesn't work indoor. Okay, there's video. Let's not watch video for now. Uh, where we are? Uh, because people are asking where we are. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Oy, 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 oy. sorry. Um, where we are? No, we are on the top of this pyramid in terms of precision because there are many, 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 many uh, providers for Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Why? Oh, it's relatively easy to do because you can get uh, uh, ready to use hardware models. You can download the software or let's say use the low level software and then you need to uh, bring on the application. This is why there are hundreds of here's Bluetooth Wi-Fi. We don't go there no, because it's well covered. Ultra wide band, well, much, much, much better technology in terms of precision and applicability to the industrial applications. Uh, still relatively low barriers because you can buy ready to use chipsets. Now, love the Decawave and some other players. And then, uh, of course, you are using the same uh, approach with getting the low level software from the same chipset provider, and your task is. Uh, it's more complex, obviously more complex than BLE positioning, but still uh, you can get uh, their up and running system relatively easily. And then it's all about higher level applications. It's all about uh, higher level uh, features like, uh, again, your product, final product, like uh, protection against moisture, like price, like battery, like many, many other. Um, 
And in case of ultra, uh, in case of moral mind, we were not able to get ultra wide bent on time. Obviously, this precision was not enough to us, and Billy was not available years back when we developed. So we developed effectively everything, our own architectures and our own protocols, our own hardware, our own software, low level, high level, and everything. So uh, this is why we were able to achieve such a great precision with such a uh, low price. No, back to my mind. A few words, I will be speeding up because it's already very, very long. Uh, and you will see our system is over the shelf 3D fusion donor navigation system, which is based on ultrasonic beacons united by radio and license free band. This is example based on super beacons. You have four station beacons, one mobile beacon and one modern. Two of these station beacons in case of four or in case of super beacon can be station, it can be mobile. You simply click and choose it. And uh, uh, there are the distance, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> there are the location is measured using uh, ultrasonic pulses between the station beacons and mobile and trilateration. But let me stress again, our system is based on radio for very precise clock synchronization and data exchange and ultrasonic for very precise distance measurement. So it's a combination of two technologies, not one, not ultrasonic, not radio, but two. Uh, no, as mentioned earlier, our system is very inexpensive. So you can check, you can compare. We are very proud of this. So it's two centimeter precision and uh, still very, very affordable. Now, as a result, as you see, we have customers in many, many, many different countries and at the same time in absolutely different uh, type of applications. What are they? All kind of robots, all kind of drones for inspection and all kind of virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, you know, customers are coming and saying, robots are great, everything is perfect, but can you do the same for real environment? What's the real environment? Forklift, carts, all kind of mobile objects. Sure, you install the mobile beacon on your forklift and you know everything about the forklift. Speed, average speed, running time, uh, speeding, not speeding, broken acceleration, everything. Everything is recorded, everything is stored and ready for analytics. Some analytics is embedded inside, but we also provide you the access to this uh, raw data and you can build effectively billions of different uh, options uh, for the external analytics. For what? For improved mobile assets utilization. The same people are coming to us and saying, okay, great, but can you do the same with people? Sure. This is why this Mount helmet, it has embedded uh, navigation, it has IMU, and it has op options to connect external uh, things. What are those things? Uh, emergency button, a vibro, all kind of alarms, light alarms, or any kind of alarms, or geofencing. So it means that the person with a mild helmet entering the geofencing area, there will be alarm for the person, there will be alarm for the boss, and everything is recorded. For what? for safety and productivity. What are the cases? Many, many, many different. Underground, mining, metro, construction, manufacturing, dangerous, oil, gas, refineries, very many. Everywhere where you want increased productivity by knowing who is doing what, where, and why, and improve safety. Prevent things happening is much, much better than you know solve those uh, bad accidents. Um, as mentioned earlier, we have two different architectures, non-inverse architecture and inverse architecture. Non-inverse architecture is uh, very robust and it was developed first, and non-inverse architecture works in this way. You have stationary beacons, which you install on their walls or ceilings every, oh, okay, in this case 25 meters, but it's for mini RX, and uh, okay, every 30 meters or closer. Uh, those beacons are controlled over radio by the modem. So the modem is working and talking to each of the beacon over radio and synchronizing the beacon and controlling the beacon. So the modem is the smallest element physically, uh, but logically is the most important element. It's responsible for uh, size clock synchronization. It's responsible for all controlling and uh, distributing of the task between the all elements. And it's responsible because it's not only rotor, but it's a modem to 
to the external world. So none of their applications are needed to run the systems. You, you don't need uh, cloud intentionally. If you do this intentionally, you don't need the cloud, you don't need my online servers, nothing like this, in order to run for the system. If you want to be absolutely closed and not leak any location data outside, you're absolutely free to go. You, you can do this with our system because the modem with complete map can function without anything else. The modem is sufficient. You just power up the modem, the system is there, the modem knows the map, all the beacons knows the locations, and uh, you know the locations of all mobile beacons. Mobile beacons know all of its location, and even the mobile beacon knows the location of other mobile beacons. Or, again, collision avoidance, because you know position of all your robots, or all robots know position of each other. Uh, the map uh, and building of the map consists of two elements. First, you need to provide uh, the location in case of mini RX of each of the station beacon, in case of beacons hardware version 4.9 or super beacons or industrial super beacons, they calculate the distances between each other by themselves. Let me stress, you don't need to calibrate anything. You physically put the beacons inside your building, they have line of sight, you put the system into the mode of building uh, their sub-maps of beacons, and uh, what is left to you to do is just to confirm, okay, I see that uh, distances are right, the system is helping you to estimate that, and you just confirm it and freeze the sub-map. So our non-inverse architecture, and inverse also, uh, with uh, many beacons, support self-building the map. No calibration needed, no manual entering needed, uh, MiniRx is a limitation in this case. It's small and it's not able to emit the sound, unlike Beacon Hardware version 4.9 or unlike Super Beacon or unlike Industrial Super Beacon. This is why you do need to enter the distance between them. Distances between them, all of them, or uh, location. They are mounted on the wall, ceiling, and uh, they are measuring the distance to the mobile beacon using ultrasonic pulses, because the modem basically controlling everyone and everyone knows when the mobile beacon is emitting ultrasound by measuring the time of flight, it's able to calculate their, uh, the distance. By knowing the distance from this to this, from this to this, from this to this, the data is sent back to the modem and the modem is calculating the position and then it distributes the position back to the mobile beacons. That's it. The system is capable to be connected with many external uh, devices. Robots, drones, anything. We are using mobile, uh, or let's say virtual UART, uh, regular UART, then pins, SPI, I2C. In case of industrial application, additional there is RS-485 for industrial uh, applications. Uh, you can get the data either from the mobile beacon directly, for example, for the robots or drones, or you can get the data from the modem. So it means that and the robot knows its current location, and also the modem knows the location of any robot or any drone or any person inside uh, your system. Many uh, mobile beacons, they have IMU on board. Sometimes accelerometer plus gyroscope plus compass, sometimes only accelerometer and gyroscope. Everything is in 3D, obviously. And you can get the location data up to 25, meet, uh, to 25 hertz, but it totally depends on the distance. For larger maps, it's rather close to 8 hertz. For mid-size, 16. For very small maps, a few ma meters aside, you can get up to 25 hertz. With IMU Fusion, in non universe architecture, you can have 100 hertz with 15 milliseconds delay. In regular systems, uh, the latency would be update rate divided by their, uh, one divided by update rate. So if you have uh, eight hertz, you can expect around 125, 150 milliseconds uh, latency, unless you use the averaging. Averaging gives you higher precision and higher confidence and higher, let's say, uh, or more robustness to jumps and all kind of interference, but it gives you latency. And it depends on what kind of uh, 
uh, real-time player using or what kind of averaging because they, they have many. So you can increase the latency up to, let's say, one, two seconds. And instead of two centimeters, you may have less than one centimeter uh, precision. So much better precision and much more robust, but for the expense of latency. So it's up to you. You choose. There is a trade-off. In inverse architecture, it's significantly more complex in terms of internal structure, but for you as user, it's nearly the same. So the difference is that in this case, mobile beacon is emitting ultrasound and station beacons are receiving. And in this case, mobile beacon is receiving ultrasound and station beacon is transmitting. But as you see, station beacons transmitting different frequencies, 19, 25, 31, 37, 45 kilohertz. We have currently five frequencies. Uh, so it means that if you want a basic submap or basic map consisting of one submap, then you simply need to choose, for example, 25, 31, or 25 and 19. It's a must for inverse architecture that station beacons that have different ultrasonic frequencies. It's a must because uh, otherwise the uh, mobile beacon will not be able to distinguish ultrasonic signal is coming from this or from that. Uh, but if you have uh, larger maps consisting of, let's say, tens of beacons or hundreds of beacons, obviously you need to repeat, start repeating frequencies because we have only five. And there are many methods. And this is one of the complexities of MiniRx. Currently, we do provide uh, remote guiding guidance uh, for uh, indoor architecture uh, deployment and re indoor architecture uh, calculations. Uh, but for non inverse architecture, you can do this easily because we have so called placement manu manual. Go to our downloads page and use a uh, placement manual. But for inverse architecture, we recommend uh, uh, for complex maps, we do, uh, we do for you the calculations. <coughs> Sorry. Otherwise, the capacities are the same. Um, otherwise, the capacity of both um, inverse architecture and non-inverse architecture are the same. So currently, we support 250 beacons, mobile and stationary, combined. Uh, so overall recommendation, non-inverse architecture is great for something noisy, like drones. Uh, uh, for some reason, you cannot have a, a noise near the mobile beacon. And inverse architecture is perfectly suitable, first of all, for people tracking, because you usually don't want something, you know, ultrasonic ticking on you. It's okay for robot, it's perfect for drone, uh, it's okay for forklift, but usually people prefer that nothing is ticking on them, so inverse architecture is your choice. And ultrasonic is far, 5 meters, 20 meters from, and uh, nothing is ticking. Even though you don't hear usually ultrasound, but you can hear the small tick uh, uh, from ultrasonic beacons, especially if it's a very quiet area like museum. Um, and the next one. Uh, what I covered until now are usual cases. Warehouses, robots, drones, people. But we have multiple, multiple, multiple cases for long tail. I will not go too deep into this. Uh, uh, but those cases sometimes are, are very, very useful for very special applications. Like one of these is this. So you want to warn users when a large HGV is approaching. In this case, you do not cover the full uh, area. You do not provide coverage like for very, very long way of these uh, large HGVs. No. GV itself is the map. So you install the station beacons on your large HGV. So effectively, the whole map is moving. So from a GV point of view, this is a station beacon because nothing is moving. But, but from the point of external world, the whole map is moving. So it's kind of moving station beacons. It's not oxymoron, but it's kind of thing. What are the benefits? The benefits is that you have your thing moving and when a person is in dangerous area the person will be uh, alarmed visual vibration sound anything you wish uh, depending on the options every time when the, something is closer than uh, 
bigger area. So geofencing area. So this is kind of moving geofencing area. And this could be up to 30 meters uh, radius, radius from your AGV or from anything moving. Um, the same on the construction side. Here you can combine all this. So you may have station big and you can define geofencing or area in this area. You can deploy a regular uh, system on site. You can put um, um, mobile beacon, or let's say not a mobile beacon, but the whole system on your crane. So it means that the crane will be moving, like in the next one. Crane will be moving, and the crane will provide, uh, or let's say, have the moving geofencing zone. Not the crane, but the, the tip will be moving, and where the tip is, there will be a dangerous zone. Again, for safety. So, uh, site, uh, like construction site, is usually a very complex area, and uh, sometimes it requires multiple different uh, approaches. Uh, regular map, moving geofencing zone, multiple floors. Uh, so contact us, give us description, and we would be able to provide you uh, with a solution, as well as these options. It could be a regular beacon for very quick installation, regular beacon with external power supply, or it could be a fixed beacons with fixed power supply if it's inside. Uh, another special case, um, you don't need to worry about all the areas. You need to worry about areas under the crane or under the tip, under the cargo. And in this case, you place the beacons, or actually station beacons, and they build the map of station beacons right on the tip. And every time when the crane is moving, their geofencing zone is moving along with the crane and you provide the safety for the workers, not just general safety, because it's not relevant, but uh, uh, but you provide the uh, geofencing zone only where it's really dangerous. Another example, um, um, another example, you don't uh, want to cover uh, with the beacons, uh, the full building. Um, okay, back to, to this. I was interrupted. Um, uh, for example, in the case when you don't want to cover the whole building with the system, well, because it may be too expensive for you. Well, you may have spots covered. It's very special, but we can do this as well. For example, you want to track your cleaning workers that they do perform the tasks. What does it mean? So it means that if the worker must clean every 15 minutes, we can easily detect with the system that the person was at least inside this building or inside the uh, spot where the cleaning must be done uh, in each uh, 15 minutes. Not like the person comes at the end of the working day, marks everything that, okay, I was there, 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 but the system is obviously tracking that the person was not there during this time. You cannot track with our system that the person actually did the job, but at least you, you can be sure that the person spent whatever 5-10 minutes and you hope that it was cleaning during this time. So there are many options like this, and uh, it means that based on our system you would be able to deploy not only a regular precise and navigation system with uh, blanket coverage, but some special cases as well. Um, today we support a single modem system covering uh, large distances up to a few hundred meters and this distance uh, is defined by the radio so the beacons must not be uh, farther than 30 meters so your mobile beacon must be within 30 meters from two or more station beacons uh, but in terms of radio, the coverage is much, much larger. With full-size antennas, it's a few hundred meters. No, let's say 400 meters. So it means that from the modem, and you have a tunnel, 
for instance, or large uh, assembly plant, you install the modem in the middle, full size antenna, you can have 400 meters this direction and 400 meters this direction, taking, for example, this industrial super beacon with, with full size antenna. Uh, but what to do if there's no coverage or there's no direct visibility even for radio and the distance is more like long, long tunnels? Okay, in this case, uh, we will be supporting, not yet, but it's coming pretty soon already, so-called uh, multi-modem systems. Multi-modem system is basically the same single modem system, but with one layer additionally. Already currently we have a uh, modem, which is responsible for the map. Map is consisting of uh, sub-maps. Uh, each sub-map is either one, or two, or three, or up to four beacons. And altogether you will have 250 beacons per sub-map or per map, or 250 sub-maps per map. That's what we currently have. What is coming, this multi-modem system, is effectively the same, but you will be able to have up to 250 super-modems, which will be under control of so-called super-super-modem. So that means that the system will be able in coming, let's say, two, three months, would be able to uh, support a few thousands of beacons and it will be support their uh, applications when radio coverage from super modem to the beacons cannot be provided in other floor or larger distance or for some other reasons. So in this case there will be another super beacon, those super beacons they connect to each other for uh, data, not for synchronization where we need our own very, very precise clock synchronization over, over our own radio. But for uh, data exchange and location data streaming, uh, tens of milliseconds is usually not an issue. This is why regular Wi-Fi is okay, Ethernet is okay, LTE is okay, and uh, or private LTE is okay. Uh, but this is for data, not for synchronization. And there's super uh, modem, and then the super modem is uh, basically a single point where you look at all this map as a one large map. Don't see all this complexity. For you, it's just one, 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 one large map, which is stitched together by the super super modem. Um, now, I already mentioned that uh, we have a very, very uh, large variety of different applications, from the virtual reality to drones, from drones to uh, forklifts, for forklifts to humans, from uh, industrial humans to sport. So this is why we have multiple variants of beacons. Some of them are only receiving ultrasound. Some of them are only transmitting ultrasound. Some of them are universal, capable and transmitting and receiving. And some of them are more protected. More protected in terms of uh, temperature, moisture, and even exposure. So intrinsically, whatever, uh, exposure protected. And of course, the price is different, size is different, power consumption is slightly different, uh, but uh, majority of them have the batteries, except for industrial uh, and this battery-less option. And uh, of course, uh, most of them can be used uh, in the same architecture. Like, for example, you can build a very uh, diverse non-inverse architecture consisting of station beacon mini RX, station beacon super beacon, station beacon industrial RX, and the mobile beacon mini TX, and the mobile beacon industrial super. So you can do that if you wish so. But usually, of course, we recommend to have uh, less, uh, let's say, zoo of beacons. Finally, summary. No method suits all needs. Choose yours. It totally depends on your application. We certainly can recommend Marl Mind, but even Marl Mind is not perfect for all location. Choose yours. Sometimes ultra wideband is better, sometimes BL is your choice, sometimes the sensor fusion is option, LiDAR could be an option. So it totally depends on your applic application. Um, specifically designed for positioning systems like Marl Mind and or GPS ultra wideband or GPS is better for positioning in majority of cases than other 
let's say, not specifically designed for positioning uh, standards or types of system like BLE or Wi-Fi or LoRa. And my favorite sensor fusion is the best. If economically viable and technically feasible, you can always get the best result out of this. As usually, thank you very much for this time, for your time. If you have questions, don't hesitate, send us a message to info at mylmind.com. Watch demos. We publish quite often new demos and uh, new tutorial, and this tutorial will be published as well. And well, we will be happy to see you enjoying our system. Thank you very much.